Hello and welcome once again to INSEAD's LeaderCast series. My name is Charles Galanick and I'm the Dean of the EMBA. It's a pleasure to have in this LeaderCast Peter Goldmark, who is the former Chairman and CEO of the International Herald Tribune from 1998 to 2003. And currently he's the Director of the Climate and Air Program for Environmental Defense. He'll be interviewed today by Loic Sadule, a professor in economics and political sciences here at INSEAD. Their topic will be leadership in the context of environmental challenges and concerns. We hope you'll enjoy this leader cast. Davos just ended, and one of the interesting agenda items was the environment coming back on the radar screen. Yes. Um, with this greening, this push to the greening of the economy and the pressure even on the emerging markets or the newly industrializing markets, are there particular examples of interesting responses from leaders that you have seen or come across? Well, one that was captured at Davos and was most dramatically illustrated two days before Davos was the announcement by a group of iconic American companies that the United States had to pass a carbon cap now, that it had to begin to reduce emissions right away, and that it had to be part of a trading system. And when you get a group of companies like General Electric, Alcoa, DuPont, Caterpillar, then you have a visible demonstration of what has really happened in the American political system, which is that business is removing its veto. There are a lot of things in the American political system business can't force to happen, but they do have a veto. And when business, broadly speaking, wants something not to happen, it will usually not happen. Now, European business has long been ahead of American business on this. Uh, and it's not an accident that the American businesses were many of them multinationals, although there were some utilities there. What's missing, I would say, so far, and was also evident at Davos, is where is the leadership of the large developing countries who are listening, receiving messages, beginning to think about this seriously after years of saying reflexively, you polluted, then you developed, now we pollute and we will develop. Don't rush us, don't tax us, don't take away from us the road that you travel. But now something else is going on. We have not yet seen the results of that. On that aspect, what is the role? What do you see? You have had a career both in the public sector and the private sector. What do you think are the roles that the private sector plays? What is the role that the public sector plays? Should there be a limit on the role of governments? And how about for the, uh, for lack of a better word, the, the, the social sector, such as the organization you work for now, what are their roles in this intervention? Well, I would argue that two of the three sectors you mentioned are the most globalized. And when you're dealing with global issues, like climate change, like terrorism, like weapons of mass destruction, like the availability of water, you want to look at those sectors of human endeavor that are the most globalized. And by globalized, I mean they operate in several countries, through different cultures, not imposing one culture, but incorporating and acting through different cultures in a variety of different modalities. And there are three sectors of human endeavor that are really globalized. One is the private sector that you mentioned, one is the nonprofit sector that you mentioned, and the third, which we won't talk about much today, is of course the world of organized crime, which is a distinct sector and very globalized and meets all the tests I said. The biggest problem we face now that globals are issue, uh, that issues are global, and that's the arena we're in, is that the public sector is one of the least globalized sectors. And in that sense, we're talking today on a program that is part of a series about leadership. A friend of mine wrote a book that was originally entitled Leaders Without Borders. And if you look what sectors are producing leaders without borders who can move beyond and through borders, the NGO sector is and the private sector is, but the public sector is not yet. And since the public sector has to set the rules within which the other actors operate, whether they're riding market forces or social change forces, if the public sector is behind, which I argue they are, that is trouble. An interesting 
bridge, maybe, is there for the press, yes. which is then exposed to the global issues, but with a very strong local presence, and unlike other businesses, have a certain public good aspect to it. Now, I would place the press, ironically, by and large, in the three less globalized sectors. One is private, we discussed. Another one is the world of religion. Now, remember how I defined it. It doesn't mean their aspirations aren't universalist. It means they accept and operate through many cultures, through many modalities, and many of the world's religions are, in that sense, not globalized. The press is in the process of globalizing, but as a force is still largely national. Largely gives you news through a national medium, sometimes through a regional or local medium, and therein is the problem. USA Today you can buy all over the world, but the lens is American. Even CNN, what was that early business decision in the CNN case? that they made. The early business decision was, shall we form partnerships with news organizations in local countries so that it's CNN Turkey, CNN India? They didn't. They went the other way. So even though you think of CNN as having a, I'm not going to use the word global, a wide presence, is it a globalized organization? No. So when you look at this kind of evolution, do you see that the press, just like brands, will become more globalized? Where they put pressure on global leaders? Or will they remain within national markets? That's a big question. Or if we can change it slightly, at what rate? There's no, direction which, no question which direction the arrow is going. But are they going to change quickly or slowly? And that will be a function of other forces. Let's refine the word press a minute to talk about independent news organizations. So now I'm excluding the Disney's and the movies and MTV, okay? Because we use the word media, we use it. So now news organizations. Most independent news organizations in this world are print-based or print-related. An exception would be the BBC, which is a highly literate, but it is an independent news organization. The economics of all those independent news organizations are changing. Where do they get their revenue? The century-long alliance between editorially independent print and advertising in what is essentially a monopoly, single page limited offering is now being destroyed in front of our eyes. So you and I don't know how fast that will go. But it is clearly the potential there for a globalized press to place demands of a global nature on national public sector leadership. And that would be interesting, but it doesn't happen now. You don't find a single president who gets up and he'll read the International Herald Tribune, but he won't say the International Herald Tribune is putting pressure on me. The pressure is coming from the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung or the local national paper or TV. You had dinner last night with 12 or so MBAs from INSEAD, you organize these series of dinners with young, high potential uh, students or human beings. Um, if, you put, if you compare them to your position when you were their age, do you see a change in awareness, in their vision, in their responsibility, in the action they take? And what do you see as their challenges that they are going to have to face 15, 20 years down the line? Very good questions. First of all, let me make clear, these dinners are with young people. And the purpose, which I explained to them, is to help me stay in touch with reality. Since when I was young, I worked for older leaders, and I said to myself, I never want to be as out of touch with reality as the people I'm working for are. So this is one of the forces I engineer in my own. These were INSEAD students, and they were terrific. They were one of the smartest broadest ranging group. So I'd say the first characteristic is the range of their experience and their knowledge. Global, multi-sectoral, very nuanced, multicultural, which is different from multi-sectoral. Very interesting. The quality of their ambition, the quality of their ambition was broad rather than narrow. They wanted to excel. They wanted to lead 
some of them in more than one field, either sequentially or they weren't sure what field they wanted to be in. All of them were aware of their privileged status and that they are part of an elite. Almost none of them used that word, but by their actions, their words, their reference points, they understood they were privileged and that they were part of an elite. And of those to whom much is given, much will be asked. Nobody said that last night, but I think that was there. Now, what will they be called on to do? Now, Loic, I'm going to get a little bit grand, okay? My generation is leaving them some real problems, which I would argue are ultimata. What's an ultimatum? An ultimatum is something which, if you don't respond successively or effectively to it, it will have very, very bad consequences. And two of those are climate change and the spread of weapons of mass destruction. And either of those, if not addressed successfully, could change the course and character of the human adventure on this planet. So the generation which those 12 INSEAD students that I had dinner with last night will have to. That's the ultimatum. It's not an elective. It's a required course to deal with those. And what a moment in the human adventure that will be. And it has begun. It's not tomorrow. It's begun. If that's the way uh, things are going, what do you think are the new leadership characteristics that you feel are going to be very important for these managers as they come and take on the role that they will? Well, I think of three, and they get increasingly difficult to explain. So the first one I'm just going to call anticipation, which is not a foreign concept. But when you think of running a division of a company or running part of an NGO or all of an NGO, anticipation is going to be more important in the sense of really looking ahead and planning for what is about to happen, not reacting or responding. There's that famous old saying from the world of hunting, don't aim your gun where the bird is. Aim your gun where you think the bird is going to be. But that now becomes more important as we begin to act horizontally like tennis teams. I'm looking at the ball here, but I know right where you are as my partner, Loey. That's teamwork and that's anticipation. I don't even have to look to you. I know where you are and I know what you're going to do as I get ready to hit the ball. That's anticipation. Two dimensions. The second one is to develop leadership that goes beyond borders or without borders, as we said. Uh, because many of the most important forces, dynamics, reference points, and policies and undertakings will be transnational, where the border is porous or non-existent. And that's both for good and for evil. That's the way we'll have to approach health. That's the way organized crime now approaches the world of narcotics. So it's, it's both for good and for evil. It's a fundamental characteristic of the force field. Now, the third one, forgive the clumsiness of my words, I'm going to call it the minoritarian stance. Most leaders in the history of the human adventure have grown up as members of an ethnic majority. Now, what is an ethnic majority? The human being has an arena of consciousness within which each person thinks the world is unfolding. Now, the, for tens of thousands of years, the arena of consciousness was the hunter-gatherer tribe in an area of maybe could be as could it be as big as a thousand square kilometers or even more at the limit of your arena of consciousness if you came in contact with another another hunter gatherer group chances were it was the same ethnicity as you and if it was not it was the other and it was the enemy and it was a threat to your culture your gods your ancestor your way of living so human beings evolved to function within a force field of the ethnic majority, and its leadership did too. Now, what is the arena of consciousness? Sometime in your and my lifetime, the arena of consciousness of many human beings became the globe as a whole. Was it when we saw those pictures of the Earthscape from the Apollo shots? Was it when people in the Gobi Desert started being able to see Dallas soap opera night? What was it? It was one of those moments. And now the arena of consciousness in which the human being imagines everything to be taking place is global. And that is the first arena of consciousness in the history of human race in which there are no ethnic majorities. And the implications of that 
are immense. And it means those people who have, because they were a minority themselves or understood it, who have the skills of how to function as a minority rather than as a member of a majority will have a huge advantage. And that's what I call the minoritarian stance, because there are no majorities now. Does that mean that for leaders coming from the majority, businesses coming from the majority, having to have a certain amount of social responsibility, does that mean leaders themselves are going to have to have individual social responsibility about understanding, about caring, about showing a, a deep understanding of minority interests? Also? I think it will. And I think, to use a little stronger word than you use, somebody coming from the majority, who grew up in a majority culture, now functioning on a global leadership platform, will have an extra handicap to overcome. But we associate handicaps historically with minorities. And now that's will have flipped. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.